I don't, why is that so hard to grasp? It's, it's a 25 foot drop and we're using magnets. I'd be more worried about the heat. Well, it's like any computer, isn't it? If you switch off the fan, it's gonna get really hot. So I'm, I'm jumping into uh, uh, an oven, essentially. Yeah. Mission Impossible as a franchise has had a very long road to get towards at today. Because even though its earlier movies, for example, were always a pretty big deal and did help Tom Cruise climb up to stardom, it never really managed to build a solid enough foundation for itself that wasn't in probable danger of suddenly just collapsing. But the installment that in many ways saved this franchise and cemented both it and Tom Cruise at the very top of blockbuster Hollywood was 2011's Ghost Protocol. In of itself, I don't believe Ghost Protocol any longer is the greatest representation of what Mission Impossible is or can be. Compared to Fallout and what that movie does in terms of action and narrative and characters and emotion, you'll quickly find that all that stuff in here is pretty basic. But despite that, this film very much still carries huge importance for two reasons. Firstly, obviously, this is the movie that brought MI and TC back in form. Without Ghost Protocol, there is no Fallout. But secondly, and more importantly for this video, Ghost Protocol is an incredibly efficient masterclass in one specific aspect of filmmaking, building situations. Essentially, what I mean is that whereas usually movies consist of multiple standalone interconnected scenes that make up the story they're telling, Ghost Protocol works a bit differently. In Ghost Protocol, the story consists mostly of just a few bigger key sequences that run for multiple scenes at a time. We have the smaller beginning prison break sequence, we have the Kremlin infiltration sequence, the Dubai heist sequence, the Mumbai finale sequence. Each of these sequences functions as their own larger comprehensive situations that the scenes within all work together to serve, lasting somewhere from 8 minutes up to a half an hour. They all follow the same structure and they all do the job about as well as the job can be done. They're entertaining, they pack a bunch of power, and the journey they take us on ultimately ends up feeling very satisfying. Which is why... Uh, Sorry, I'm reading stuff of Google Drive and it's being a bit... Okay. So yeah, that's what I want to explore further here today. To look at Ghost Protocol's method of creating sequences and the structure those sequences follow. How they begin, how they sustain, and how they end. Here's how you build situations. Firstly, going into the situations, this film always wraps them in entertainment value by immediately defining their ultimate objective and this way the inherent obstacles standing in the way. Take for example the Kremlin infiltration sequence. Before we're marching into the Russian military headquarters in disguise, you know what is the missing piece of the puzzle that this movie first gives us? The purpose for why we're marching into the Russian military headquarters in disguise. IMF has learned that Cobalt is or was a level 1 nuclear strategist for Russian intelligence. Therefore, the only way to uncover his actual identity is to penetrate the highly secured archive inside the Kremlin and retrieve Cobalt's file before he can destroy it. The reason why knowing this objective of going into the Kremlin right away is so crucial is because that known objective is what in the audience's eyes initiates the Kremlin sequence. Think of it as a gunshot of a race. We now have a finish line we're racing towards and the race isn't over until we've either crossed or failed to reach that finish line. We have bigger main goals for the story overall but this mini objective is what distinguishes the Kremlin situation as its own comprehensive thing. And that's also the thing where the entertainment of the situation comes from. Because now that we know where we're going, it feels like we're moving somewhere. And now that we're moving somewhere, something is bound to stand in the way. Which in turn incites conflict. Igorov. Once we hack our way down into this hallway with Ethan and Benji, it's very clear to us that the archive room we need to get to is further down it and restricted. By definition, then meaning that the guard sitting at the end of the hallway is an obstacle that we need to overcome. And that is what we then effort to do, which is what makes this into a situation. The obstacle is what gives us conflict. The conflict is what gives us entertainment. If we don't know we're going in the archive room, we're not actually going anywhere and can't have 
have anything in the way, and thus we don't have conflict or entertainment. All we do have is Ethan and Benji trying to prank this random Kremlin guard, which would just come off as incredibly boring. And I know this might seem obvious, but if you've seen my other videos, you already know that a lot of movies are incapable of establishing clear objectives for their entire narratives, much less for individual sequences. Not Ghost Protocol though, whatever the sequence, it always first lets you know the point of that sequence, maybe even a bit too officially so. Our objective is to intercept the sail, place the authentic codes with counterfeits, and follow Wistrom. Alter its infrastructure with the hopes of convincing two people that they've had a meeting which actually... Hendricks needs it to launch a nuclear strike and we have to shut it down before he gets that chance. And to do that, we need to get the access code from him. What you do want to avoid though is having the sequence objectives be so thoroughly explained that those explanations themselves become just boring exposition dumps. There are different opinions about exposition and I know that even masters like Fallout writer director Chris McQuarrie prefer to just get the information out so that they can move on to the good stuff, but I personally like the James Cameron approach where you should try to make even the exposition entertaining. Hide it in action, hide it in tension, make the information something that the heroes have to fight to get. Or, like Ghost Protocol showcases in the prison break sequence, find a way to present the objective without any exposition at all. With a simple image of a door opening, this film has clearly established why we are here. We now know for sure that the main point is for Ethan to get out. We now know for sure that the prison guards, for example, are an inherent obstacle standing in the way. We now know for sure that what we have here is a situation. And all it took was a single shot. A shot designed to build... God damn it. Sorry, it's just, I'm reading this from Google Drive and it keeps trying to sign me out for some reason. Hold on, I'll clear my browser cookies, maybe that'll work, sorry. Yeah, so to build an entertaining situation, you first need to clearly define its ultimate finish line and then make the journey to that finish line inherently hard enough to the point where it's unsure whether or not we can actually reach it. Oh god. Jump. Hey, jump! Secondly, no matter how long the sequences here might be, they don't ever get stale because Ghost Protocol continuously ups their inherent power level by cranking up the difficulty. The best example of this here being the Dubai heist sequence. Basically, our heroes know that there is a meeting going down in the Burj Khalifa between our main villain's henchmen and a contract killer who is selling a set of stolen nuclear launch codes. And so the purpose of the sequence then is to, well... We give the hotel a facelift. Wistrom will think he's arriving at Moreau's suite. But really, he'll be walking into our decoy room. Well, I'll double Moreau. Downstairs, Benji will double Wistrom. Masks. And meet with the real Moreau. Essentially, we need to take over the hotel's security system and pose as the contract killer to give the villain's henchmen false launch codes that we can then follow to find the villain. Quite the undertaking already by nature, but still fairly straightforward. That is, until we quickly then come across a bit of a hiccup, where in order to take control of the security system, we have to get to the server room from the outside. We? I'm, I'm on the computer. And just like that, what started off as a fairly simple switcheroo has now escalated into Ethan having to climb up the world's tallest building with nothing but two glue gloves, which is quite a task. Just not quite as much of a task as doing it with just one glue glove. <laughs> By sheer effort and willpower, Ethan does make it up to the server room window with one glove, where he then uses his laser cutter to neatly get inside. Correction, he has to force his way inside without the laser cutter, which he then finally does. So what you're seeing here is this movie constantly deliberately having things go wrong in a way that ups the difficulty in reaching the situation's ultimate finish line. And there's a couple reasons for this. One, it obviously makes the inherent obstacles of the sequence feel bigger and bigger because every moment things are harder than they just were. And two, it also helps build characters by placing them in extreme dilemmas that require extreme choices and actions. Like here, now that Ethan has gotten them into the security system, turns out that the bad guys are already starting to arrive meaning that Ethan has to get down there right now. And so, how does he pull that off? By making an extreme choice. Your line's not 
long enough! No shit. I know that's just one short section of examples, but watch the film with this in mind and you'll notice that things are constantly going wrong. Like once Ethan gets down for example, turns out that the villain's henchman has brought with him a nuclear scientist who can check the codes. Meaning that our heroes are now pushed to the choice of handing over valid nuclear launch codes, which ups the sequence's power and importance once again. And the reason why this mentality of escalation and making inherent obstacles bigger is so crucial is because that's how you build power for your situations. Abort. Because in essence, the bigger and harder the obstacles grow, the more exciting it will be to watch characters try to adapt and overcome them. What begins as an easy extraction Bobcat, someone else has crashed this party. becomes anything but easy. What begins as a basic prison escape oh God, he's not going to the extraction point. becomes much less basic. What begins as a simple tailing mission <laughs> becomes something much more entirely. Again, the thing to watch out for though is going overboard. There's a moment in the hotel for example where even the mask maker suddenly breaks, which feels a bit forced because it comes out of nowhere. And so even when you have things go wrong, be sure to make it justified. Like with the laser cutter breaking, the reason that works is because it was preceded by the moment with Benji. But in essence, just make sure that things in situations keep going wrong so that the obstacles keep growing and the heroes keep having to adapt and go that extra dangerous mile to save the day. Oh sh**, it just signed me out of Google Drive. Oh f and I just cleared my cookies. It's not, it's not signing me back in. I, I, I don't remember my Drive password because it's supposed to sign me in automatic. I, I'm always signed in. I, I can't get in. I can't finish this video. Uh, okay, okay. Wait, hold on. I think I might have my drive password stored up. I think so. Yeah. So if I try now, it should autofill the right one for me, right? Please. Please. Yes. Oh my god. Yes. We're back in business. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That was a that was a close call. But anyway, yeah. Have things go wrong. Finally, Ghost Protocol always manages to conclude its sequences in a way that they end up coming off as satisfying experiences to the audience, which it does in a couple ways. The first thing you'll notice is that usually we don't ever actually win. In the Kremlin sequence, for example, once we get to the files revealing the villain's identity, it turns out that not only are those files already gone, but that we're being set up as well, ending the sequence in defeat. And the same repeats over and over. In Budapest, we get our hands on the nuclear codes only to die and lose them. In Dubai, we try to pull a fast one on the villain and just end up giving him exactly what he needs. In India, we get into the nuclear satellite system only to realize that we're too late to shut it down. Altogether, pretty much in every sequence, we lose. And the reason for that is that this way, the movie conditions the audience to think that there's no way we can ever win a sequence. There's no way we can ever actually stop the villain. And so so then, when at the very last sequence, after all these losses, we finally do, it feels incredibly satisfying. But the problem with your heroes always failing in their objectives is that they become inactive passive shells who don't move the story forward. Which is why, even though the heroes in Ghost Protocol pretty much always lose, they still always manage to also complete their sequence objectives, just not in the way they planned. Look at the Kremlin sequence again and you'll notice that even though we fail to get the files on the villain's identity, we still meet him on the way, which leads us to learn his identity. That could be Kurt Hendricks. Has a nuclear launch device. I saw him. Even though in Budapest our hero dies and we lose the codes, we find out who took them, which leads us to the villain meeting in Dubai. Even though in Dubai we do lose the codes to the villain, we now know exactly what he has and what he still needs, which leads us to India. In India, even though we don't shut off the satellite in time, us hooking into the satellite system still gives us... No, no, no. He's revealed himself. Benji, can you pinpoint Hendrix's location? Uh, Hendricks is signaling out of a state-run TV station 6.7 miles from here. So essentially, we always succeed through failure. We do get over the sequence obstacles. It just always turns out that there's another obstacle right there behind them. And this way, your heroes always remain active. This way, every sequence and situation always pushes the story forward and serves a larger satisfying purpose.
Another way this movie creates that satisfactory feeling is by setting the sequence endings up to be something special. In Dubai, remember how we caught a quick glimpse of that distant sandstorm and then determined it's not a problem? Well, Just like that, with just one narrative element set up earlier on, your basic sequence ending chase scene has become something truly special. And it doesn't stop there. How can Ethan possibly see anything in the sandstorm? Maybe with those climbing goggles he forgot in his pocket. How can Ethan possibly find the bad guy? Maybe with that tracker we thought we weren't gonna need. Essentially, we have all these different bigger and smaller elements from earlier in the sequence coming together to serve a larger purpose at the end, which makes the end feel, you guessed it, satisfying. And one more thing I want to point out is the way this movie handles the ending of the India finale sequence. See, the launching pad into this is very much your basic angle of we have to stop the villain before he launches the nuke. But then suddenly it turns out that the villain has already successfully launched the nuke, which turns the dynamics of the situation upside down. There has to be a way to abort the warhead. If there is one, it'll be on the launch device. We're gonna get that case. All of a sudden, this finale sequence operates not with the possibility of what if, but on a certainty of yes unless. We're no longer trying to stop something from about to happen. We're trying to stop it from happening. We're no longer fighting to win. We're fighting not to lose. All of which, again, then makes our ultimate victory release that much more dopamine. But I don't want to go further into this yet, because I have a video coming on on Christmas where I talk about it in a broader sense. Altogether, though, how do you build a situation more effective than the one where we know what we have to do, have to face increasing obstacles to do it, in a way that history as well as all kinds of other past aspects and elements imply we cannot get done, and yet succeed in doing it anyway? I honestly don't know. All of that sounds pretty good to me.